Welcome to another video by Flat Earth Trads. Please subscribe, like and share it. I was speaking to you last time about the dogmatic formulation of the mystery of the Trinity. And uh, received this question, well how does that help us to meditate on the mystery of the Trinity? And the technical formulation of the mystery of the Trinity does not help us a whole lot to meditate. We meditate on the, on the simple reality that there are three persons in God and the fact that there are three persons that God gives himself and that the Son is the perfect knowledge of the Father and the Holy Ghost the perfect love of the Father and the Son and, and, and that the three persons give themselves and, and knowledge is a gift but most particularly the Holy Ghost who is the Spirit of the Father and the Son is a perfect gift. And the fact that God is not alone in himself is certainly a source of our meditation. We can certainly meditate on the fact that the Father sent the Son, God so loved the world as to give his only begotten Son, and sent the Son into the world. And it's not just God in unity determining, but God sending his Son. And, and that imitates a lot more the, the mercy, the love, the goodness, the bounty of God towards us as does the mystery of the Holy Ghost. However, the, the greatest treasure and grace for being able to meditate on the mystery of the Trinity is what we call the appropriations. And if I have enough time today, I'll get to that and I'll speak a little bit about how we can appropriate certain attributes of God to different persons of the Blessed Trinity, which helps us to know the persons and to meditate upon the persons. And so, God willing, I'll get to that a little later on. But uh, what I'd like to talk about today are the different um, dogmatic expressions of the mystery of the Trinity. Dogmatic expressions that are de fide and which, by which the Church has clarified the mystery of the Trinity. And some of them will surprise you perhaps a little bit because you may not have heard of them. Everybody knows that it's defined a faith that there are three persons in one God. But it's also defined that there, in, that there are in God two processions and four real relations. You might say, whoa, what do those words mean? And I would like to explain in a simple manner, if I can, what those words mean so that we can understand a little better the mystery of the Trinity as defined as being a faith by the church and know better our faith and defend our faith, of course, also. And so, so that's the purpose of this little talk then, is to explain some of these other teachings about the mystery of the Trinity which are not so commonly known, but which are de fide even if they're not you know, in most catechisms. And the first uh, question is that of the processions in God. And there are two internal processions in God, and it's of faith. There are two processions, because if there were not two processions, there could not be three persons. Oh, wait a second. Two, three. I don't get it. Well, you see, the first person does not proceed. He is the principle of the other persons. And he is not the, uh, the fruit of any procession. And so he doesn't proceed. He is the principle, the father. The son proceeds. And the first procession is the procession by which the father engenders the son. And that's one procession. By which the second person comes from the Father. But there's not just one procession, there are two processions. Because the Holy Ghost proceeds likewise. And the second procession is that in which the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. And so two processions. First procession, which is the generation of the Son, and the second procession by which we get the Holy Ghost. We find those processions 
in sacred scripture, the first procession by which the Son comes from the Father, for example, in St. John's Gospel, chapter 8. For from God I came forth and have come. For neither have I come of myself, but he sent me. The Father is sent from the Father. The Son is sent from the Father. He comes forth from the Father. He proceeds from the Father. That's the first procession. And likewise, the Holy Ghost. We'll see that in St. John's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 26. When the Advocate has come, whom I will, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father. So the Son will send the Advocate from the Father. He is the Spirit of Truth who proceeds from the Father. So consequently, the Holy Ghost proceeds. And that's the second procession by which the Holy Ghost proceeds. So the Son proceeds and the Holy Ghost proceeds. There's two processions interior in God. And that's, of course, what we profess when we recite the Nicene Creed. And we read in that verse 26 of chapter 15, he proceeds from the Father. Does that mean he proceeds from the Father and from the Son? Filioque is the word in the Nicene Creed. It certainly does. We'll get to that in a second. Second point is that it's the divine persons who proceed, the Son who proceeds and the Holy Ghost who proceeds. But it's not the divine nature. The divine nature does not proceed. Why? Because all three persons share the exactly same identical one divine nature. So we can't say that the divinity proceeds. The divinity does not proceed. The Son proceeds. The Holy Ghost proceeds. The Father inge generates, engenders. The Son is engendered. The Holy Ghost proceeds. But God does not proceed. The divinity does not proceed. And that was against the error of Abbot Joachim. That, that was de defined by the Fourth Council of the Lateran in the year 1215. Um, there are three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. In God there is Trinity only and not a quaternity. Because, if, because any one of the three persons is the reality of God. Every one of the three persons is identical to the divine nature. Namely the divine substance or essence or nature, which alone is the beginning of all things. And that reality, the divine nature, is not generating, is not engendered, does not proceed, but it's the Father who generates, the Son who is engendered, and the Holy Ghost who proceeds. So there are distinctions in the persons and unity in the nature. So it's not the person, it's not the nature that proceeds, but the persons that proceed. Um, what about the first procession in which the word of God proceeds from the Father? And we say that that is by manner of generation. The Father engenders the Son because the Father, that's what fathers do, they engender sons. And that the Son is related to the Father as a son. The Word of God is the Son of the Father. We find that explicitly stated in the prologue of St. John's Gospel. And, of course, it's based upon our human knowledge of paternity and filiation, fatherhood and being a son. And that truly applies to the mystery of the Trinity. The Son is one who comes forth from the Father. The Father is the principle of His existence. And likewise it is in God that the God the Father is the principle of the Son. They have the same nature. The Son is not a creature. He's not made like to the Father. He has the same nature as the Father. And that's a perfect engendering. Whereas here on this earth, our fathers engender us in a similar nature. We have similar genes, we have similar, similar qualities, for better or for worse. We tend to inherit the, the, at the characteristics of our father, of our parents. But in God, there is absolute identity of nature. And that's a perfect engendering. 
And that is defined in the church's teaching that it truly is a generation of the father by the son. Oh, sorry, of the son by the father. And it's defined amongst other places in the Athanasian Creed. The son is from the father alone, not made, not created, but begotten. Begotten means engendered. And so he's engendered. And uh, um, which means a true and proper affiliation. He's not adopted by the father, he truly is engendered from the father, from all eternity, in exactly the same nature. And that's a true and real generation. A much more perfect generation than a human generation but which we know as a generation by our analogy with the human generation of, of sons by fathers. So that's the procession, the first procession by which the second person comes from the first person. Now, nobody disputes that and nobody disputes that that engendering is in a, by way of intellect like like we engender a word, we conceive a word in our mind. So likewise the word, the second person is the word of the Father conceived. A perfect image, perfect representation, because identical to the Father. And so the manner of procession of the second person from the first person is in our human way of understanding by manner of intellect. He is the word of the Father. What about the second procession? And that's a question which is dog dogmatically has been the subject of much dispute and which is interesting for us to examine. The procession of the Holy Ghost. Now, as Mr. Job says mentioned, the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and from the Son. And the two, the Father and the Son, together make up a single principle of the procession of the Holy Ghost and um, and he proceeds by manner of spiration and that's the technical term which is given and it just comes from the word spirit basically the procession of the of the spirit is by manner of spiration because the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and from the Son together that is a defined dogma of the faith and it was defined amongst others by the Second Council of Lyon in France which was one of the councils of union of the church of the Eastern Church with the Latin with the Roman Church which was held in the 13th century um, <coughs> let me just quote that text for you of the um, and it was the um, it was the profession of faith that the Greek Orthodox made when they joined up again with the Roman Catholic Church in the year 1274 and um, in faithful and devout profession we declare that the Holy Spirit proceeds eternally from the Father and the Son. Not as from two beginnings, but from one beginning. Not from two breathings or spirations, but by one breathing or spiration. The Most Holy Roman Church, the Mother and Teacher of all the faithful, has up to this time professed, preached and taught this. Um, <coughs> some, through ignorance of the irresistible aforesaid truth, have slipped into various errors. We, in our desire to close the way to errors of this kind, with the approval of the Sacred Council, condemn and reject those who presume to deny that the Holy Spirit proceeds eternally from the Father and from the Son, as well as those who with rash boldness presume to declare that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son as from two beginnings and not from one beginning or one principle. Um, why is it a disputed point? The text that I quoted you from Holy Scripture, St. John's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 26, said that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father. 
But remember, it's the Spirit, the Paraclete, the Advocate, whom I will send you from the Father. So, already our Lord says that the Holy Ghost comes from Himself, the second person. And He is the second person. He has no human personality. He is a divine person. Holy Ghost comes from Him. He sends the Holy Ghost. Therefore, the Holy Ghost comes from Him. So, it's, He proceeds from the Father, but He's sent by the Son. And so, consequently, He comes from both together. And if you look at some of the texts of Holy Scripture, St. John's Gospel, in the discourse that our Lord gave after the Last Supper is the one which explains that. There is chapter 14, verse 16. I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate to dwell with you. I will ask the Father, the Son sends Him. And likewise, verse 26, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Who he will send in my name. It's by the authority, therefore, of the Son that the Father sends the Holy Ghost. He will teach you all things. And then chapter 15, verse 26. Whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness concerning me. And so the Father and the Son are both involved whenever we find talk about the sending of the Holy Ghost. We find also in chapter 16, verse 7, it's the same discourse. Um, if I do not go, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, that is, if I leave you, if I leave the earth, I will send him to you. So the Son sends the Holy Ghost. And it's in this sense that we see that the Holy Ghost sends the Son. Sorry, that the Son sends the Holy Ghost. What am I saying? The Son sends the Holy Ghost. Although He proceeds from the Father, He's sent from the Son. He comes from both the Father and the Son. And if we look again at another text, in chapter 16, verse 15, All things that the Father has are mine, Jesus says. Well, if the Father sends the Holy Ghost, so does the Son. Everything the Father has is His. That is why I have said that he will receive of what is mine and will declare it to you. If the Son possesses everything that the Father possesses, then he must share in the power to send, to spirate, to breathe the Holy Ghost. Okay, but you might say it was not in the original Nicene Creed. And it's perfectly true. In fact, the original Nicene Creed of the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 said nothing about the Holy Ghost at all. It only had the first part of the Creed, stopping before, I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and Giver of Life. It didn't have that section at all. That last section was added by the first Council of Constantinople in the year 381 to refute the heresy of Macedonianism, which denied the divinity of the Holy Ghost. But since it was not necessary at that time to profess the faith that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and from the Son, it simply said that who proceeds from the Father, apart from proceeding from the Father, he proceeds from the Father, not that he proceeds from the Father and the Son. And so in the count, the Creed of Nicaea, as promulgated in the year three, 381, does not have and from the Son. And so the Eastern Orthodox grabbed onto that as the point of separation from the Roman Church. The procession of the, of, of the Holy Ghost from the Son as well as from the Father was first defined in Spain by one of the local synods in Spain in the year 589. And they added the Filioque at that time to the Nicene Creed. And it was only centuries later, in the ninth century in fact, that the Filioque was added to the Nicene Creed in Rome. And what the Eastern Orthodox in separating themselves from the Roman Church did was to refuse the novelty of the adding of the Filioque into the Creed. What's the response to the objection? It was a certain Photius who was the, in the ninth century, the first 
the first patriarch of Constantinople to separate himself from the Roman Church and one of the justifications that he used to separate himself from the Roman Church was the novelty that Roman added the Filioque into the Nicene Creed. And of course it was not always in the Nicene Creed. However, if you read the Eastern Fathers of the Church, you'll find exactly the same doctrine taught by them as is taught by the Latin Fathers. The Latin Fathers who taught about the mystery of the Trinity in the 4th and 5th centuries were St. Hilary of Poitiers and St. Augustine in particular. And, and, and they taught that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and from the Son. However, if you read the Latin, sorry, the Eastern Fathers, and in particular St. John Damascene, who summarizes all of the Eastern Fathers up, they attest that the Holy Ghost pro proceeds from the Father and by the Son by the Son from the Father because it's through the Son that all things come and that the Holy Ghost comes through the Son. Well to say that he is from the Father and through the Son is to say he's from the Father and from the Son and there really is no difference whatsoever between the teachings of the Eastern Fathers and the Latin Fathers in the quest, in the in the subject. The, the Father and the Son are complementary they made up together one principle from whom the Father, the Holy Ghost proceeds. So consequently the idea of the Holy Ghost proceeding from the Father and from the Son means just from one indivisible principle. It's consequently not a novelty at all. It's simply a clarification of what had always been taught by the Fathers of the Church and what is found in Holy Scripture. And consequently which was rightly placed into the Nicene Creed as a development of Catholic doctrine and a more profound understanding of the truth that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and from the Son. St. Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, you know that he died as he was going towards this Second Council of Lyon which brought about the unity with the Greeks. He never made it there. But his teachings were certainly uh, prominent and St. Thomas explained the reason why it is theologically that the Holy Ghost must proceed from the Father and from the Son and that it's impossible that he proceed from the Father alone and the reason is this because the only distinction between the three persons of the Blessed Trinity is the relationship that they have one with another there's no other, they have the same nature, there's no other distinction. And the relation they have one another comes from the way they proceed one from another. And so the Son proceeds from the Father alone. And so what makes the difference between the Father and the Son? That the Father comes, the Father is the Father and the Son is the Son. And the Son proceeds from the Father. That's the only difference. Now, if you were to say that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father alone, that means he would be identical to the to the Son who proceeds from the Father alone. And there would be no difference between the Son and the Holy Ghost because they both would come from one person. Because the only difference between the persons is how they proceed. So if the Holy Ghost is not to be identical with the Son and the same person as the Son, he must proceed differently from the Son. Well, how can the Holy Ghost proceed differently from the Son? The only way he could proceed differently from the Son is that he would proceed from the Father and from the Son instead of from the Father alone. Consequently, it's necessary that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and from the Son. <laughs> and it couldn't be any other way than and, 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 and the mystery of the Trinity requires then, as St. Thomas Aquinas explains, that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and from the Son. And However, that's what was refused by the Eastern Orthodox, by Photius in the 9th century, and then by Michael Celarius, who was the uh, um, 
the uh, patriarch of Constantinople in the 11th century. And you know the famous date of 1054 in which St. Leo IX, the Pope, sent his uh, legate, Cardinal Humbertus, to Constantinople. And at that stage, the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church had refused to acknowledge the, pape, the popes for 40 years already, since 1012. St. Leo IX, of course, was a good pope. Cardinal Humbertus was probably a rather too zealous gentleman, a rather too um, harsh in his manner. But uh, Michael Chilarius was a pure politician and he wanted independence and he certainly didn't want to submit to Rome. And he used several questions as a reason, justification for his split from the Roman Church. One of them would was the horror of horrors that the Roman Church would use unleavened bread and that is a Jew Jewish practice and so the Romans are just, just hidden Jews because they're using unleavened bread for the holy sacrifice of the Mass. <laughs> if you can believe that is a justification for splitting yourself from the Roman Church but that was one of his justifications and it shows the smallness of mind because the Eastern Church used leavened bread and the Roman church said, well, you can use leavened bread, no problem, but our custom is to use the same kind of bread that our Lord used at the Last Supper. <clears throat> Unleavened bread. And, uh, um, and, and then the other question was the question, of course, of priestly celibacy. The Roman pontiffs never insisted that the Eastern clergy practice priestly celibacy. But the Romans, of course, always insisted on it for themselves, and the Greeks didn't appreciate that. And thirdly, of course, the question of the procession of the Holy Ghost from the Father alone, and the addition of that filioque to the creed, which the Eastern Orthodox absolutely refused. And it became, of course, a point of doctrinal battle. The Eastern Orthodox, twice in history, accepted, signed, the profession of faith with the filioque. First time was at the Second Council of Lyon in 1274, and the second time was at the Council of Florence, which also was a Council of Union with the East Orthodox in 1438, just before the fall of the Byzantine Empire. It was a political maneuver to get the Latins to send troops to defend the eastern half of the empire which then fell, and of course you can see there how God's providence acted against the orthodox schismatics who had separated themselves from the true church. Alas, this question of the filioque should have been buried long ago, but it's become recently a, a, a topical question. Because a few years ago, the Pope, John Paul II, made a joint profession of faith with the, with the Eastern Orthodox Patriarch saying the creed without the filioque without the filioque and since it's a defined dogma of our faith and since the omission of the filioque is a denial of the of the Holy Ghost of his divinity of his profession and since it's absolutely essential to the profession of the faith to profess the filioque, since those who refuse the filioque have been excommunicated and condemned as heretics by simply refusing the filioque, the refusal to profess the filioque, that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Son as well as from the Father, is of the greatest importance and it can only be seen as a betrayal of the Catholic faith not as an explicit profession of heresy, because the Pope will say he believes in the filioque, but as a betrayal of the faith and of its profession as it ought to exist in the Catholic Church. And so that's why we, um, we should take special, just as we take special joy in professing in the, in the Nicene Creed that the consubstantiality of the Son with the Father, that is truly God, as and, and, and that consubstantiality in Patri. We, we really mean it when we sing it. So likewise, when we sing the filioque, 
who his who together with the father and the son uh, proceeds from the father and from the son um so what else can we say about the procession of the holy ghost the procession of the son from the father he's the word of god and it's by manner of intellect as we understand in our human way by analogy from human things what about the procession of the holy ghost who is the love of the father and the son eternal and un and, and infinite love and the holy ghost proceeds then by manner of the will because love proceeds from the will love is an act of the will knowledge is an act of the mind love is an act of the will so consequently the procession of the holy ghost differs from the from the first procession because it's, it's, it's an ex a procession by the will and so we can understand the, uh, the 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 procession of the holy ghost as being by the will of the father and the son whose common will is the love of the father uh, uh, whose common will is their mutual love who is the holy ghost and that's why we appropriate to the Holy Ghost the works of love, which are the works of the will of the Father and the Son. And we can find that in the letter of St. Paul to the Romans, chapter 5, verse 5, in that magnificent text that we, that we, we meditate on, on at the end of the Pentecost octave. It's the Pentecost Saturday, the, the Saturday of Pentecost uh, uh, the ember Saturday of Pentecost, the last day in the octave of Pentecost, we meditate on this magnificent text, St. Paul to the Romans, that the charity of God is poured forth in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, who has been given to us. And so the work of charity on this earth is the work of the Holy Ghost, because the Holy Ghost is the love of the Father and the Son together. And that's, the, 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 if you like, the second procession. But you might say, what do we call the procession of the Holy Ghost? We call the first procession engendering, because the Father engenders the Son. But what do we call how the Holy Ghost comes from the Father and from the Son? Which is comes from our will. Well, there is no name. There is no proper name. Because we can understand much more clearly what engendering is or how our, we conceive our ideas in our mind but we can't understand really well this love which comes from our will and it's, it's it's too elusive to our human minds so consequently there is no proper name for the third person of the Holy Trinity and for the way in which he proceeds from the Father and from the Son so whereas we call the second person the Word of God the third person well we just call him the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Because the Spirit is the one who, who comes forth, who is a Spirit. And He's holy, but we don't have a proper name, so we just call Him the Holy Spirit. But the Father and the Son are spirits too. And so we don't have a proper name for the third person. We call Him the gift of God. We call Him the pledge of God. We call Him the love of God. And they reflect different aspects of, of, of a procession by manner of will. But we can't express the uh the third person nearly so clearly as we can the second person the spirit the holy ghost the holy spirit there is no proper name because the term spirit refers sim it's common to all three persons they're all a spirit you see and so uh, the one who is engendered is called the son the one who comes to inspiration what's he called there is no name we call him the holy ghost so that's why the Holy Ghost has no proper name. Other, you know, the one who aspired, well, the Holy Ghost. Whereas the Son has a proper name, it's the Son, or the Word of God. And, and of course, the, 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 the advocate is one who takes our defense. The paraclete is one who's sent to speak to us. And so that's God with respect to his creatures, not in the, in the interior mystery of the Holy Trinity. And and we're going to see, which if we have time, which we may not, that the, we, when we speak about those names of the third person, they refer to a function of God with respect to his creatures. 
which is he's our consoler he's the advocate he's with us but all three persons share together that function and it's not really particular to the third person it's by manner of appropriation that we speak about it as belonging to the third person but really everything which is done by god outside of himself with respect to creatures is done by all three persons together and so consequently those names help us to know something of the mystery of the trinity by analogy by appropriation by but really all three persons do it together because they're inseparable in everything that they do outside of god they're one principle they're, they're inseparable it's only in the mystery of the trinity itself that we can make a distinction so um so there were the two processions in god i like to say one word about the four relations in god whoa now it's getting complicated you might say there's three persons two processions and four relations <laughs> four relations in god and what's more four real relations in god and that's a divine dogma of our faith by the council of florence in the decree for the jacobites which was uh again one of the eastern orthodox sects that reunited themselves to the catholic church and it teaches that the three persons are in one god the three are one substance one essence one nature one divinity one immensity one eternity where no opposition of relationship interferes but there are oppositions of relationship of course and a relation is in the ordination of one thing to another or of one person to another now one relationship is the father to the son because the, the son comes from the father and we call that relationship fatherhood paternity there's got to be a relationship between the father and the son one is father to the son that's fatherhood it's a relationship then the son is related to the father he's the son of the father that's called filiation he's the son of the father it's not complicated that's two relations you need two relations for the first procession how the son comes from the father well it's the same for the second procession the first relationship is that the father and the son together are related to the holy ghost and that's what's called active spiration they together are the principle of the holy ghost because the holy ghost comes from them and so the relationship between the holy ghost and the father and the son together and it works in the other way just as the father and the son together are related to the holy ghost by active inspiration so the holy ghost is related to the father and the son together by passive spiration and there are technical norms technical words of course but with those technical words we find there are four relations between the father and the son and the son and the father and the father and the son together with the holy ghost and the holy ghost together with the father and the son together it's not complicated there's got to be if there are two processions there has to be four relations couldn't be any other way and there couldn't be three persons unless there were four real relations in god and so yes it sounds awful complicated but it's not we find that <laughs> not everybody's convinced <laughs> you're lost oh how could you be lost it's so simple <laughs> the son comes from the father and so the father is the father of the son and the son is the father is the son of the father that's two relations the father is related to the son the son is related to the father that's not complicated simple right now the holy ghost is like a child that the father and the son have together the father and the son together are the principle from which proceeds the holy ghost so he's related to them and they're related to him there's two more relations that makes four <laughs> can't have two processions unless there's four relations <laughs> and yes that is defined by the church that is the dogma of our faith we find that in the in the fathers of the church in the eastern church saint the two, saint basil the great and the two saint gregory saint gregory of Nazianzen and saint gregory of nyssa in the eastern church and of course the latin father saint augustine who spoke who wrote m most on the mystery of the trinity saint fulgentius also and we find that defined by the church 
about the relations in God. Let me find this text from the Council of Toledo, which was in the year 675. Um, as he is father, not to himself, but to the son. And he is son, not to himself, but to the father. He's got to be the son of the father. He's not, he's not the son of himself. He's son of the father. And the father is not father of himself. He's father of the son. Similarly, also the Holy Ghost refers in a relative sense, not to himself, but to the father and to the son. He's related to the father and to the son. In that he is proclaimed the spirit of the father and the son. That was in the year 675. And so, yes, there are four relations in God. And they're real relations, not just mental constructs, not just ideas that we make, but true and real relations. But although those three persons are related together by four relations, every single one of them is identical to the divine nature. That's the mystery. That's the mystery. We have three persons, two processions, four relations, but they're all identical to the nature of God himself. And there is no distinction where there is no relative opposition. So the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost is identical to the divine nature. And the relationship is identical to the divine nature. When it comes to everything is identical to the divine nature. And the only distinction is with one another. Um, I don't think I need to <clears throat> labor the point anymore. Either we got it or we didn't. <laughs> yes, Mr. Job says, existence and essence are identical in God. You can't distinguish them. And so they have the same being. The three persons proceed from the same, but they, the way they proceed is in the same being. That's a mystery which we can't understand. Because everything that we understand that comes from another, that proceeds, has a different being. You see, if it proceeds, it has a different being. But in God, no. They don't have a different being. They proceed, but they're one and identical in nature. The Son is one and identical in nature with the Father, and the Holy Ghost one and identical in nature with the Father and the Son. And so it's not a question of the divine being, because that means the same thing as divine essence. It's a question of the relationships of the divine persons. <laughs> so, but they are inseparable, the divine persons. And in everything that they do, they're inseparable. And that is the teaching of the church, which is called circumcision. Not circumcision. <laughs> no, circumcision. Why don't I write that on the board? Oh, you can't read that very well, can you? Circumcision. C I R. C-U-M-C-I-N-C-E-S-S-I-O-N. -S -S yes, there are still a few letters in the alphabet left. <laughs> circumcision. And circumcision literally means that all the three persons go around walking around together. They never leave one another. They're always walking around together. They never separated one from another. And, and, and of course, it's inseparable from, from the unity of nature. And that teaching of circumcision means that the three persons mutually compenetrate one another. They dwell together with one another. And whenever we speak about one, we speak about the others. And we can't separate one from the other in any way in which they, re they relate to creatures. They're always totally one and united together because they're all equal. They're all inseparable regard. And we find that defined by the um, the Council of Florence in the year 1438 and it quotes St. Fulgentius um, because of this unity the Father is entire in the Son entire in the Holy Ghost the Son is entire in the Father entire in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is entire in the Father, entire in the Son. No one exceeds or excels the other in eternity, or exceeds the other in magnitude, or is superior in power. They're totally one in another, completely one in another. And that's what's called circumcision. A big long word to explain a very simple reality. And our Lord himself teaches that and without usually big long words. Thanks be to God. <laughs> and 
We find that in St. John's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 30. I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. It's very simple. It means that the, the, the Father and the Son are inseparable, that they're totally together. You can't speak of one without speaking of the other. That's circumcision. Or, if you like, verse 38. The Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Uh, that you may know and believe that the Father is me in me, and I am in the Father. Inseparable. They're the same God. Inseparable one from another. Uh, or we find that Saint a little later on when our Lord was preaching, we find that uh, in chapter 14 of St. John's Gospel, and which our Lord speaks about, uh, he says, um, Do, Dost thou not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Of course. How could you question that? Then that's, they're inseparable. That's what circumcision means. And um, along with circumcision goes the, the de fide teaching of the church that everything that God does outside of himself is shared by all three persons. All of the outward operations of God, the divine operations that are external to himself, are shared equally by all three persons. They are all together the principle of all created things. And... Um, Everything comes. Everything that's created is created through the Father, from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now it's true. We read in the uh, prologue of Saint John's Gospel, through Him, through the Son, all things were made that were made. Which, but it doesn't mean that only the Son creates. It just means that the Father creates through the Son, and that all three persons work together in the creation because they're all equally God. God created everything. And so, so therefore, everything that God made, all three persons made. Um, uh, and so on. That all three persons are not three principles of the creature, but one principle. One principle. They work together in everything. That's what's defined by the Council of Florence. And it was also defined by the Fourth Council of the Lateran. Uh, that all three persons make up one beginning, one creator of all visible and invisible things, of the spiritual and of the corporal. They made them all together. Whatever the Father does, so also does the Son do. That's what our Lord says in St. John's Gospel. And so that's uh, a necessary consequence of the unity of the divine nature, that they work together. And everything that one does, they all do together. However, we can speak differently about the roles of the three persons. Although they're inseparable, although everything they do, they do together, we can nevertheless attribute certain things to one or other person. And that's what we call the appropriation or appropriations. Appropriation of certain attributes of God to one or other of the three persons of the Blessed Trinity. Not that all three persons don't do them all together. They do do them all together. But in our human way of understanding, we attribute things that are actually, in fact, belong to all three persons to one or the other person. We say of all three persons that they are all equally eternal. They are all equal omnipotent. They are equally holy, but yet we'll attribute in Holy Scripture and in the Fathers of the Church certain of these characteristics to different persons. For example, we attribute to the Father that He is Almighty or Eternity. We attribute to the Son wisdom, for example, or the wisdom through whom all things were made. Uh, and so we attribute... Uh, also to the Holy Ghost certain things goodness sanctification we attribute to the Holy Ghost we attribute to the Son that he is the image and the perfect likeness of the Father because that's wisdom we find that in Holy Scripture 
um, we attribute to uh, to to the Father divine providence, but it's all three persons. We attribute to the Father um, the work of creation, but it belongs to all three persons. We attribute to to the Holy Ghost the sanctification of souls, the indwelling in our souls. The, the because it's the Holy Ghost, we are temples of the Holy Ghost, and it's attributed to the Holy Ghost to dwell in our souls. We read that in Saint Paul's first letter to the Corinthians that we have been made temples of the Holy Ghost. Does that mean only that only the Holy Ghost lives in us, and, and not the Father and the Son? No, not at all. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost live together in us inseparably, but we simply attribute it to the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost is the way in which we can best understand God's work of love because he's the love of the Father and the Son and by that attribution to the Holy Ghost of the work of sanctification of our souls although it belongs to all three persons we understand a little more of the mystery of the Holy Trinity and how the Holy Ghost is the love of the Father and the Son and we can meditate more profoundly on this mystery of the Trinity. Just as when we understand that the, the Son is the Word of the Father, the perfect image of the Father, we can meditate a little bit on what the Son is who reflects so perfectly the Father. For example, uh, there's many texts from Holy Scripture, and I'm running out of time, but allow me to quote chap verse 3 of chapter 1 of St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews who being the brightness of his glory and the image of his substance, upholding all things by the word of his power. He's talking about the Son, who he put an heir of all things, the brightness of his glory. He's the perfect image and reflection of the Father. That's an appropriation, because he's identical to the Father. The image of his substance, but a perfect image. Upholding all things by the word of his power. Yes, because it's by him that all things were made. But is that appropriation? that it's through the Son, because all things together were made by all three persons together. But it tells us something about the mystery of the Trinity. and helps us to meditate on the mystery of the Trinity. He has affected man's purgation from sin and taken his seat on the right hand of the Majesty on high, and so on. Or just one other little text here from Sacred Scripture, the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians, chapter 4, verse 6. Because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The Spirit of His Son. He hasn't sent the Spirit of His Father. Is not the Holy Ghost? Of course it is. It's all three persons together which help us to cry out, Abba, which means Father, and to pray to God our Father in heaven because we are adopted in the likeness of the Son. And But it's not just His Spirit. It's all three persons. But it helps us to understand our sonship of God when we meditate on how the Son comes from the Father and so on and in the mystery of the Incarnation uh, let me finish with that because I need to stop uh, we find that attributed to the Father in St. Matthew's Gospel chapter 1 verse 20 and in St. Luke's Gospel chapter 1 verse 35 and the power of the Most High will come upon thee. That's the Father. And, but then it also mentions the Holy Ghost uh, in verse 35 of chapter 1 of St. Luke's Gospel. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. The third person. The power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. The first person and the Holy One to be born. The second person is to be called the Son of God. And so that... But, I mean, it's not just the third person who overshadows, it's all three persons who are responsible for the incarnation, the mystery of the incarnation. Likewise, St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 20. Uh, for that which is begotten in her is of the Holy Ghost. You can take her as a wife, because that which is begotten in her, the angel says to St. Joseph, is of the Holy Ghost, attributing then to the Holy Ghost the work of all three persons in the... Um, creation of the human nature of the Son of God. I managed to get done with appropriation a little bit. <laughs> okay, then I guess we'll say a prayer. Call it quits. We hope that you enjoyed this video. Please don't forget to subscribe, like and share.